so in terms of so so once we know that there is this high genetic element to some of our complex behaviors not just um medical conditions but also things like uh political reasonings or uh, religiosity for example or our intelligence once we accept that there might be a high bio biological element to that then where does that leave us in terms of parenting because obviously there was you know if intelligence is around 50 percent uh, hereditary then there's still you know half of it which might be sculpted by environmental factors okay so what does neuroscience tell us about that and again I talk about some of the um, recent results within the book so there's some lovely studies coming out of um, Victoria Leong's lab um, she was at Cambridge University but she's recently moved to Singapore and she's been looking at how brain waves how these electrical oscillations um, start to synchronize between the parent and the child, the very early newborn child, mm -hmm. as the parent is looking the baby directly in the eye and talking to them. And you get this beautiful start of synchronicity of electrical oscillations between the parent and the child as, as there's interaction going on. And particularly when the parent is happy um, rather than feeling sad and maintains eye contact. Um, and singing as well. So nursery rhymes seems to help with these electrical oscillation synchronization. And what she's found is that this synchronization is very important for helping to boost learning and memory. Um, so it's really interesting. And it's not something that you get just with the parent and the child in that dyad, but you're also getting it um, in groups of people as well. Um, so when we're trying to make sense of the world around us, we're not actually taking in information from the world around us as a continuous video stream. Our brain creates the illusion that we've got this continuous video stream by kind of knitting information together. But we're actually taking in little bits of information, snapshots of information from our eyes and from our ears and our sense of balance and sense of taste and touch. Um, and then combining all of that into this continuous stream. And what Victoria's found, Vicky's found, is that actually you can start to take the st same timestamps, the same bits, the same segments of information from the outside world when your brains are oscillating together. So they're firing together and, con and, and then creating, in some ways, a, a very similar continuous video stream when you're looking somebody in the eye and when you're um, directly communicating with them. What she found, and that, and that helps to boost learning and memory and helps to, in some ways, reach a group consensus as well between um, people coming to different ideas about the world around them. Um, but unfortunately, you don't get such a high rate of brain synchronicity over video. So it's got to be, so, so a key aspect here is, um, is being able to be in the same room and having contact with that person. So you can help, basically you can help in terms of um, uh, interactions, you can help your child learn about the world and help boost their brain capability by having as much interaction with them as possible. Mm. It's really interesting. And of course, I think you, you well, you definitely wrote this pre um, a time when we all communicate over video and hopefully we're coming out of that time you do say specifically in the book not knowing what was going to happen how important that I, 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 I just like to go back to one of the things that comes through in the book very very strongly is that it's it's not simple nothing is it's not binary that it's not that our brains are manipulated and, and plastic and that we can do change everything as we you know that we have complete agency and it's also not that it's entirely innate. And I think one of the places that's so fascinating is in the study of epigenetics, which is the place where almost more than anywhere, it's not binary. So it's not innate biology. It's not just environment. But perhaps you could explain how epigenetics shows how those two things come together and have such an important impact. Yeah, I mean, so this is... Um... And again, it's a fascinating area of research that's really come up in the last 10 years, um, possibly longer. And there's not an entirely, um, there's not a huge consensus amongst the scientific community. There's still some researchers who are very, very much against some of the research that's coming out. Um, but I want to talk about some of the initial studies that came out in 2014, I believe it was, from um, Dias and Kerry's lab in America. And they did some groundbreaking studies that really left the neuroscience community reeling when the results came out. Um, and they, the, this study has actually been cited over 600 times, I think. Uh, so, yeah, and, and it's been replicated since as well. 
what they found is that now most neuroscience studies initially take place in model organisms and those model organisms are usually mice or they can be worms c elegans for example which sounds a bit weird but we can return to that point if you like um or even drosophila so little fruit flies um and the reason for that is that you can start to really have a look at some results that you might find in humans and look in model organisms and see how those results might be replicated in other organisms that share similar conserved brain um, circuitry uh, and function to us. And you can start manipulating the behavior and really honing in on the information. I'd also like to add that since my studies in PhD um, days, there's been these amazing new technologies which mean that less animals are having to be used. So for example, now I could take, um, I could pluck a little hair from your arm and at the base of that hair would be a little follicle um, and there's stem cells there. So these are cells that can continue to grow throughout your life. And I could take some of those stem cells that are at the base of your hair from your arm and put them in a dish, a little Petri dish and start growing them with different factors and then start adding tweaking little growth factors into that um, those stem cells in the dish and you could start to see how um, almost a neural circuit a flat kind of not not really a brain structure but a neural circuit will start to form in that petri dish and that neural circuit will have your genes in it um, and will start to form form governed your genetic information which is absolutely groundbreaking work so it's fascinating work um, that, that, and these types of technological developments have really meant that we can stop using animals as much as um, we had previously. But Kerry and Dias did some incredible work and they were looking at mice. Now mice usually love the sp sweet smell of cherries um, and they've got a receptor for it in their nose. And when they smell this beautiful sweet smell of cherries, they'll send an electric signal all the way from their nose to an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is a key area of the brain that's involved in pleasure and feelings of motivation and reward. So this will light up that region of the brain and the mice will feel motivated to scurry around and try and find that nice sweet treat so that it can nibble on it. So what um, Kerry did was, that, and this is an evolutionary ingrained behavior that's written into that neural circuit that connects these two regions of the brain. Um, and so, sorry, the, the nose and also the, the um, nucleus accumbens. And so what Kerry and Dias did is they did something that's called Pavlonian learning. So they broke that association of sweet treat, nice smell, um, and something nice to nibble on. And they broke that association in the brain by accompanying the sweet smell of cherries with a mild electric shock. And very quickly, after a couple of iterations of them doing this, the mice learnt, whenever they smelt sweet cherries, to suddenly kind of freeze up in anticipation of a mild electric shock coming. And they learnt this very, very quickly. Um, and so Kerry left them like that. The mice uh, kind of didn't smell cherries after that, and they didn't have any electric shock. And they went on to have a very nice life. And they had children of their own. And the children, um, had no electric shocks and no sweet smells of cherries and those children had a lovely knife and they went on to go and have grandchildren so now we're so their children so now we're talking about the grand pups of the original mice that were being studied and they wondered okay what's going to happen to these grand pups well what will happen when we waft in the sweet smell of cherries and what they found was that the mice were similarly becoming very sensitive and freezing in anticipation of an electric shock even though they had not experienced any um sweet smell of cherry or electric shock. And they even fostered out the pups to different parents so that there was no communication of the experience, if you like. There was no storytelling um, from the mice that was going on. There was no imitation learning that was occurring. So they ruled out that. And they found that there was a biological mechanism that was written into the grandfather's sperm that was altering the way that that um, receptor and that nerve tract was running um, so that instead of running to the nucleus accumbens, the region that's involved in um, uh, pleasure and motivation, it was turning, it was changing so that it was now running and being directed to the amygdala, which is an area of the brain involved in the fear response. So involved in that kind of um, freezing up in anticipation. So there was markers within the grandfather's sperm that was literally rewiring the brain of the um, children and the grandchildren, pups, mice, as they grew up. Um, so there's yeah, a fantastic study which really left the neuroscience community reeling. Um, and since that study has been released, we've been finding similar um, results that um, in, for example, uh, Holocaust um, descendants, there's some epigenetic changes. So this change in the way, not the DNA is coded, 
but the way the DNA is shaped and how that results in a change in the expression of the genes um, during development. And we're seeing similar things in um, des descendants of the Holocaust. And there's some wonderful studies that have been taking place um, looking at um, in Pakistan, in FOS villages in Lahore, some of the children there that have experienced very early years trauma. And you can start to see different metabolite changes in their blood that are being passed on through their sperm or through their egg um, and can affect their descendants as well. So it's early days in this neuroscience field, but it seems as though memories can be passed on, particularly traumatic memories, um, and biologically woven into the DNA, not to change the code of the DNA, but to change the shape of the DNA and the way that that DNA is expressed. It's absolutely fascinating. And you talk about that experiment with the cherries in, I think if I'm right, the chapter where you talk about the hungry brain. Um, you know, I said at the beginning, it's really challenges, challenges one when you're reading your research to, to think very differently about certain ways that we react to things. And one of those things is food. Perhaps you could explain how then neuroscience and neurobiology can make us look in a different way when perhaps society might condemn, you know, people for making certain choices about the way they eat or for, for an obesity epidemic. There's a, there's a certain narrative that says that is a choice that people make. And you debunk that really quite, quite using neurobiology. Yeah, so I went and visited um, a fantastic researcher called Giles Yao, who works in obesity and the genetics of obesity, um, and talked to him about some of the research that's coming, about, coming out about this high heritability for um, our body mass, in, body mass index. And I'm, I had a slide earlier that was saying that 75% uh, of our body mass index um, is due to our genes, really. There's a, there's a high heritability element there. Um, and... And so, and I, and I talked to him about the different genes that are involved in making up our, um, our weight. And it's obviously not just one gene, but hundreds of genes that are working in tandem. And he's particularly interested in one of the genes that actually shares quite a high contributing factor called FTO um, and how that operates within the brain and how it um, sends signals and interacts with our gut um, to dictate when we're feeling full, our feelings of satiety and what we can do to start to alter and trick our brain into thinking that we're full or to quash any bad habits that we might have. Um, now, interestingly, he's actually genetically analyzed himself and he's found out that he is carrying the variant of the FTO gene, which means that he, he struggles with his weight. You know, he's driven to eating particular foods because of the genes that he's been given from his mother and his father. Um, and so the way around it that he's found for him and his family, because he's also conscious that he's, you know, raising um, young children. And so he wants to be a healthy role model um, and he wants to be healthy himself. So he does lots of exercise um, and he has a dictate um, kind of an edict within his household. So uh, his wife is, you know, she's got a sweet tooth. So they so they have this family policy. They won't bring any chocolate into the house. They won't bring anything that she might be driven to because of her genetic uh, background. And he's um, Malaysian, I think, by background. And so he's got uh, particularly kind of, he loves anything that's salty and fatty and sour as well. Um, as well. And so they have a edict that they won't be bringing any of those particular foods. Pork scratchings, I think he's really drawn to. So, <laughs> so he's not allowed any of those in the house. And they, and they do exercise together as a family. So they're very conscious of their biological predispositions and they're trying to work with them, with that knowledge, using it as an empowering system. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things that when you talk about certain uh, elements like that, that are shaped by our biology, you, you, you move on, as you did at the beginning, to talk about how that can shape policy, really. And I just wonder, in the, it, once we know that, once we're armed with that sort of knowledge, how, how can that shape policy when it comes to this epidemic of obesity? So for that in particular, you may have noticed that in England, at least, largely the... Um... The, in the supermarket, as you get to the final cash cash point, where you're like, thankfully, I've finished my week shopping, I can just pay now, um, I've managed to get everything on my list, um, great, and then maybe a moment of weakness comes, because you've just been, you know, wandering around the aisles for the last 20 minutes or so, looking at all this tasty food, and you've managed to maintain your willpower, um, and then you're just about to pay, and the relief of it washes over, and then suddenly you're attacked by these confectionery, wonderful chocolates and sweets and crisps that are there at that final aisle, um, and it's very difficult 
to not to cave into that temptation to buy those little treats that you could munch on immediately on leaving the supermarket. Um, well, the UK government is stopping that. They're making those um, aisles uh, the, uh, also because children seem to nag persistently at that point within the shopping. So it's quite easy to give in, not just for yourself, but your children. So they're making those, um, those sweet um, aisles right at the end uh, illegal, I think in the majority of supermarkets and supermarkets. So um, little changes like that can really help. Um, and also different systems that could perhaps tax in the same way that maybe we need to have a green tax to ensure that our carbon emissions um, as a human population decrease. Perhaps we need a fat tax so that bananas and apples uh, and carrots are a lot cheaper than um, sweet confectionery that might not be good for us. And, and the point is that you make in the book is not just the gene, but also um, evolutionary, where we are wired to crave and to want to eat food that, that's there. We just haven't caught up with an age in which food is all around us, that we don't have to go and hunt for it. Yeah, precisely. So way back on the savannah, we were there um, and we needed to have this motivation uh, wired into our brain. So this area of this nucleus accumbens that I was talking about with the mice and the cherries earlier, lighting up with pleasure and reward and motivating us to expend lots of energy going hunting um, for food or foraging to find food in the wild. And we needed to have that massive motivation to go out to find food for ourselves, but also the rest of our tribe. Flash forward to today, and obviously we don't have to expend so many calories. We don't need so much motivation in order to get our food. We can just, you know, with a click of our button on our phones, just order um, delivery and get lots of food delivered straight to us on our sofa. Um, yet that, that wiring within our brain is still there to make us want to constantly have food all the time, um, even though we don't have to expend so much calories uh, in order to get it. And so it's fighting against that, 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 um, pleasure circuit within our brain that has helped us to survive within those early days and we're now in a very changed environment uh, and, and our brain hasn't obviously caught up because it takes a long time for the brain to catch up. So and, and looking back as uh, the the ways in which our brains are wired you, you also look at the caring brain and um, how little agency perhaps we surprisingly little agency humans have in their choice of mate I mean you talk about actually this notion that women sniff out Mr. Right. But all of these things are very surprising. Again, to me, I thought we, I have gone through my life thinking that we had a lot more agency than your book suggests. A lot of what we are actually doing is something that is evolutionary, that we're hardwired to do. How does that work in terms of choosing a partner? We're, we're wired to be social creatures. Yeah, so, I mean, there's some really interesting work um, looking at so, so our brains are only consciously processing a very, very small amount of information that's coming in through our senses all the time. Um, it's something in the region of, you know, 0.1% of all the information that's coming in through our brain is, a, is the information that we're consciously aware of. And the rest of it is subliminally going on in the background. And there's some wonderful work that's coming out of Simon, um, Sarah Garfinkel's lab at University College, and she's looking at introspection. So our ability to kind of try and be more consciously aware of some of the information that's being processed in the background. And she's done this lovely study whereby if you can exercise your introspective ability, by the way, so if you, for example, go and run up and down the stairs for a little bit and then sit and just concentrate on your heartbeat. because There's lots of information that's being transferred through the body and held within the gut, for example, or the heart. And there's information that's being coming up through the brain through the neural circuits there. So just sitting and listening to your heartbeat and listening to your body and the nervous system that's within your body and how that connects to your brain and spending a minute, a few times a day doing that can actually exercise your introspective ability, exercise your intuition. And they've been, there's been some lovely work from Sarah's lab and also from Joel Pearson, who's based in Sydney in Australia, looking at this science, scientific basis for intuition. Um, and what they found is that there's a particular area of the brain called the insula, which is very much linked to this ability to pick up on signals that are going throughout our brain and our body that we might not otherwise be consciously aware of. Um, and those people that are better at this introspective task, listening to their heartbeat and picking up on subliminal um, signals, actually have an, an increased insula brain region. And it's more reactive and it's got more gray matter. So it's got more connections between the different nerve cells in this particular region. And then kind of putting this 
information and applying it practically. There's a wonderful study by John Coates. Now he's a fantastic um, character. He uh, used to work on Wall Street as a stock stockbroker many decades ago, and then he moved. He made a lot of money, uh, became very wealthy, and decided to do um, a self-funded PhD at Cambridge University at the business school there. And um, what he found was that those stockbrokers who were particularly successful on the stock floor, so they were able to kind of intuitively pick up on what was going on in the mood of the people around them and what was going on um, kind of collectively and pick up on the intuitive um, signals that he may not have been consciously aware of. Otherwise, those people that were particularly good and made lots and lots and lots of money and, had, and particularly made huge amounts of profits, even when recessions, for example, struck, he found that they had a larger insula, a more reactive um, kind of plumper gray area, more connections within the brain of this um, insular area, and that they were better at this introspective heartbeat detection task as well. So they had a better in intuitive value. So there's, so there's something there in it for all of us, really, that maybe this, this uh, kind of lockdown situation over the last year has helped us to be able to tune in to our introspective ability a little bit more because there has been a little bit more silence from the outside world. Um, so perhaps that could be a good thing for all of us. But going back to your initial questions about um, how we uh, use information from the environment and that we may not be aware of to make really life altering decisions, like for example, who our mate, uh, who we might settle down with and have children with later in life might be. There were some lovely studies that were conducted many, many, many years ago, decades ago now, um, and they took a panel of women who were asked to, they were blindfolded and asked to sniff different t-shirts. And these t-shirts had come from different men who had worn these t-shirts for two days uh, and had kind of slept in them as well. And they weren't allowed to do anything too smelly within these t-shirts. So they weren't allowed to wear deodorant or to eat a curry, for example. Um, uh, and they were just, you know, kind of their, their odors permeated these t-shirts and then they sat these t-shirts in a line and the women went along and sniffed them and some women were finding the t-shirts quite uh, wonderful to smell they found the smell quite attractive um, whereas other t-shirts were not quite attractive to the ladies and what they did is they also genetically analyzed the men and the women and they looked particularly at the, at the MHC complex so which is a, com um, uh, it's a part of the immune system within our genes, it codes for different um, immune system kind of very important parts within our antibodies. And what they found is that the females that had a particular MHC uh, genetic code were attracted to males that had a completely opposite MHC code to them. So they were attracted to a diversity. And the thinking is, is that actually if they found them attractive, then they would produce children that their MHC genetic um, repertoires would combine to give them a very strong, very wide repertoire of immune system within the offspring. So the offspring would have a higher chance of surviving because their immune system would be stronger. They'd be able to fight off more bugs. So that's just an like uh, just one way that we can, uh, we're taking in information all the time that we may not be consciously aware of and it's impacting on our decisions later on in life. 